On this episode of the 10 Code Public Safety Podcast, we're discussing all things training with Murfreesboro Fire Rescue Department. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Public Safety Public Information Officer Larry Flowers. Today's guest is MFRD Assistant Fire Chief of Training, Nicole Miller. Assistant Chief Miller, welcome. Thank you for having me, Larry. Sure. Appreciate it. Now, proper training is crucial for the safety of firefighters as well as, you know, the protection of residents of the city of Murfreesboro. So we're going to start from ground zero. What does it take uh, for a new recruit to become a certified firefighter one at MFRD? Well, we take people who they can come into the fire department without a degree. So Mm -hmm. it's great for kids um, who don't want to do the college route and want to do more of the technical angle. And uh, we can take that person with no training and we start off with the first week. We do some administrative things. Usually the city does their orientation day that first week. Um, We're going to do some online training prerequisites and CPR usually. Mm -hmm. So the first week's taken up by some of those kinds of things. And then we start into uh, our fire suppression training and we'll do that for about two or three weeks. We're kind of expanding that program, the pre-recruit training. So they'll start off with learning how to use their uh, SCBA, getting used to their PPE, starting with uh, physical training in the mornings and such you know, things like that. And then we move into our recruit class if they don't come in already certified. Mm-hmm. So our recruits have about a uh, about a 10-week recruit class. We're, we're adding a little bit to that for our next one probably. Um, it usually starts with hazardous materials awareness and hazardous materials operations. We usually start there. They get their certification through the state after they've completed that portion of the class. And then we move into the fire suppression. And that's, you know, like I said, it's a total of about 10 weeks. And then they test for their fire one. And that covers a lot of different subjects. And and you sort of led into it. You said about 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. What, equivalent of about 100 hours of training Uh, or more? Our our recruit class currently is about 375. And we have upped that because we were really doing more. And we just didn't... um, increase the hours with the state so I just resubmitted that and it was more like 475 hours so they it's it's intense and um, it's a very good program and we have a lot of other departments that come in and partner with us in a lot of our recruit classes the last one was just Murfreesboro but we often have guest uh, recruits with us and you know their instructors will help us with that too sure Uh, and we have to brag a little bit though Uh, I understand MFRD has one of the best training academies for fire in the state of Tennessee. Some would even argue in the nation. I think so. I think (laughs) our program has gotten a lot of attention from other departments and we've been expanding it. We hope to be able to do all of our own live burns soon. Um, I've put in the budget for some props so we can do that. Let's hope we get those council do you hear me (laughs) Uh, um, but we currently have to send our recruits to TFACA still to meet all the requirements to get the live burn portion completed but um, um, hopefully we'll get our props and be able to expand a little more on what we do and be completely self-sufficient right right and um, I think you had sort of touched on it uh, about training recruits from other departments you know, there are smaller departments across the state mm-hmm. that rely on, you know, departments like MFRD to send their recruits to training. Yes, it, it's getting increasingly harder to get into TFACA's program. Mm-hmm. They have a great program, too, but they have a wait list. So a lot of times we'll have um, neighboring departments from um, Laverne. We've had Lebanon. We've had Lawrenceburg. Um I'm probably leaving some out. Um, Hendersonville, we've had some from Hendersonville in the past. But they come in and will send their recruits with us because they can't get into the state's program. And they'll usually send instructors to help and, you know, share the, share the load a little bit. So it's, it's great. It's great because we get different perspectives, different um, instructors bring different tools for their toolbox, I guess you could say. Right. So it works out great. And something new I understand that you have implemented since you've uh, become an assistant fire chief of training is the lateral hires orientation uh, training program. Uh, What does that entail and, you know, like the number of hours, you know, uh, getting these experienced firefighters, I guess, on the streets sooner? Well, we already had an orientation program. I've just expanded on Mm -hmm. it a little bit more. It was a 40 hour and we've moved that to 100 hours. So it's kind of like a mini uh, recruit class 
just to make sure they're hitting all the check boxes and making sure they're trying to our standards because they could come from all over the country and we really don't know what their background is. And we were seeing that maybe our laterals weren't getting as much attention as our recruits. So we've tried to expand on that a little bit more to make sure that they're where they need to be to meet the standards of Murfreesboro Fire Rescue. Do you pr prefer either our new recruits teaching them from ground zero or laterals with experience that you can get them on the streets quicker? Um, you can definitely get laterals on the, sh on the streets quicker. Um, they both serve a good purpose. I like to be able to hire recruits because mm -hmm. it's giving the, these kids a chance to come in with no training and no background and it gives them a chance at a really good job and, and the, the best career on the planet, I think. Right. So it's a, uh, I mean, but laterals, if we're more in a hurry to fill those spots, that's a great too. And we get a lot of great people from across the country and locally. And so really they both are great hires either way. Right. So. And you had mentioned, uh, you know, if uh, some young people do not want to go the college route, that this is a great career opportunity. What's an age limit? What's the, the, the age that it takes for them to uh, join? 18. 18. Yep. Wow. 18. Minimum at 18. And because uh, I can't send anybody to a live burn or anything until they're 18. Mm -hmm. And they can't receive uh, medical licensure until they're 18. So, yeah, we can take them right out of high school and uh, give them a pretty awesome career. And uh, once you become a certified firefighter one, um, there are a number of training hours that they have to, uh, to do, you know, with the State Fire Commission. They require those hours. How many hours is that? Well, to maintain their Fire One, it doesn't require any specific amount of hours, but we have so many mm -hmm. yearly or annually right. required training for different things. Um, one of the things is our educational incentive program through the Fire Commission. That requires 40 hours every every year, and everybody has to complete um, 20 live hours and at minimum. And you know, a lot of times we'll do 20 online training hours. Um, also, we have uh, ISO training hours that's required, and that's um, 192 company hours. That's has to be structural firefighting related um, 18 facility hours which means 18 of those hours has to be conducted at our training facility um, six hazardous materials training hours and then officers and drivers each have to have 12 hours of officer or driver training depending on their rank so okay. and then we've got multiple city required trainings <laughs> and hazardous <laughs> material techs need eight hours a year so there's there's a lot do the public really understand how many training hours that a firefighter goes through? Absolutely not, because we're not even touched on the medical training and right. CEUs required. So it's just constant. We constantly are um, working to maintain our CEUs, maintain our required hours, get all the check boxes met, and to just maintain our skills and you mm -hmm. know new trends and new training and um, things change over the years. So what you started out doing in your career you've completely changed to something else mm -hmm. um, 20 years later 30 years later you know it, it just changes over time so it's a constant um, battle to keep up with everything and, and maintain our certifications and you uh, mentioned a second ago about the medical training do all MFRD firefighters have to be uh, you know, certified as an advanced EMT or just an EMT, what? You what have a, within your first year, you have to have at least EMR, which is emer okay. emergency EMR. medical responder. That's a minimum. Um, some of them will come in as EMT or AEMT, um, but by their third year, they have to be AEMT certified or licensed. That's a licensure. And sure, and just talk about that basic medical care that they are able to provide on the scene of, uh, to uh, patients that uh, are injured. Well, it's, it can go well beyond basic care. Oh, wow. EMRs will be more of your basic, and as, as it progresses up, you can do more and more. Um, I mean, it's going to be CPR, you know, stopping bleeding, um, maintaining airways, some very basic meds when you get to EMT and AMT level. Um, AEMTs can do IV access. Um, they can put a patient on a 12 lead and transmit it. They can't read it. And then if you get up to paramedic level, that's more of your drugs, your more advanced airways, um, advanced medications, interpreting 12 leads for a you know, heart attack patient. Wow. And, and I, I know a lot of times uh, the fire department makes it to the scene before 
the ambulance service. And so you guys are able to get there and start that medical treatment Absolutely. right away. Absolutely. And, and even if we don't get there at this at before and we get there at the same time, uh, we work great together yeah. and um, we are all highly quali qualified individuals. Um, I've been on, I've just recently completed paramedic school myself. So I've been out there riding on an ambulance, but with our crews, you know, seeing them on the scene and seeing it one-on-one -on -one is great because uh -huh. I've been out of the field for a long time. And it's great to see the care our personnel are able to give when they're first on the scene and um, how easily that transitions to when EMS is picking up the patient and how they can ride in with the EMS to give another set of hands, you know, on a critical patient. It, it was good to see that firsthand because it's been a while for me. <laughs> well, what about trauma training? Is there anything in particular or is that all part of that medical? Um, that's all part of our medical training. All of our licensure or certification levels require a certain amount of training. Like medical trauma and cardiac requires, EMRs are required to have seven hours, um, EMTs 13, AMTs 15, and paramedics 21 hours mm -hmm. within their two-year renewal cycle. So um, it's just a constant um, need for CEUs and what have you. Our medical division is very good about providing those to our people to meet their licensure requirements. Wow. So I understand MFRD recently wrapped up a uh, smoke divers class. Yes. Uh, was that like a two-week class? It's a, it's a one, a it's one week. four days, 32 hours. Okay. And what does that entail? So that is a job requirement for all of our personnel. They have to have that within 24 months of their hire date or when they complete um, recruit training. So it is 32 hours of mentally and physically demanding SCBA class. It's really meant to um, get that student prepared for an emergency if they have an emergency on their own because, you know, if you're in a structure fire and you have a collapse or something happens with your SCBA, you want to be able to maintain your composure and get yourself out. So there's a lot of um, physical exertion while you're wearing your air pack to mimic working in a structure fire. Um, and a lot of um, mentally challenging tasks that they have to complete to uh, learn to maintain and not panic. They start and end with an obstacle course. And so on our first day, we'll do an obstacle, the obstacle course. And they may, a lot of times they get, they have to at least complete one round. Mm -hmm. And then by the end of the week, they're able, a lot of times they're able to complete three or four rounds on one air bottle. And that just shows their progression on how, you know, during the week where they've worked really hard working on, um, we, we call it a five line drill where they have to follow five hose lines out on two bottles. They have prop house, which we have one of our houses over at the training facility has got all kinds of props in it. And they're, they're blacked out on their SCBA mm -hmm. and they're, you know, trying not to panic and they're in tight spaces. And, uh, you know, it's really mentally challenging for that. And a lot of people will panic, rip their mask off and, and such. So by the end of the week, um, they've progressed through that and they are, I'm glad that we have that program and that we continue to, to have this program because our firefighters are top notch and right. I, I feel like they're, I don't know, better prepared for mm -hmm. the fire service in general. So I'm very proud of that program. In, in the facility, the Doug Young Public Safety uh, Training Facility, I mean, it, it, you could put that up against anyone in the country. I mean, those, uh, the smoke divers class, I understand last week, you know, not just you know, following the lines and doing things like that, they actually put smoke in these buildings yes. and they, you know, it, it's like the real thing. It's, it's very intense. And there are some people who cannot complete the class. Oh. So it's not, it's not easy, but it's, um, it's important because we want our, our personnel prepared for whatever could happen, you know, in an emergency. And I think it's very important to maintain that program. And I think it sets us above the standard, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, what about rapid intervention training, uh, team training, or is it RIT? RIT, yes. Uh, That's more for training firefighters to rescue other firefighters. Okay. Where smoke divers is to rescue yourself, RIT is to rescue other firefighters. And that's also very intense. We don't have a full-on week of training. Usually we do that in little sections, I guess you could say. Um, but that's just as important, and it's required by NFPA 1407 mm -hmm. that we have RIT available on scenes um, that are dangerous and you might have to rescue firefighters out of. 
and, and that's not an easy task. I mean, even the, you know, the, the dummies that we use out at the training facility, you know, it's not easy even pulling those no, uh, it's to not. safety. It's not. And when you have a firefighter in all their gear, SCBA, PPE, mm-hmm and you're wearing your SCBA and PPE and you're having to drag in the equipment to rescue them right. as well and you probably have zero visibility and it could be high heat conditions it's it's very difficult and it does require a lot of training and of course one of the most exciting parts of the fire service is you know um, it's a serious part because you know you have patients that could be trapped in a vehicle mm-hmm. That you guys have to use uh, what I call the big boys and big girls toys to, you know, cut them out of the vehicles to extricate them out of the vehicles. Uh, just talk about what kind of training uh, that the department requires for them to be able to perform those tasks on scenes. Well, we we do our best to get everybody out and cutting up on cutting cars um, on a regular basis, but we have so many people in our department now, actually getting cars is kind of difficult. So we do a lot of training, but it might not always be hands-on. We do as much as we can, but um, sometimes those vehicles aren't available. So anytime we can, we'll go out to, a lot of times we'll go to Charlie Clark's, or sometimes Mm -hmm. we'll get vehicles delivered out to the training facility and we'll cut them up until you can't cut them up anymore. And then um, we'll get a tow truck to come get them and hopefully get some more out. It's uh, very important to keep your skills up on all the different types of vehicles and especially the electric vehicles Mm -hmm. that poses an extra special challenge. So um, we're always looking for vehicles to cut up and new training to to keep our skills up. Uh, A few months ago there was um, a chain reaction crash at Las Castas Pike Northfield Boulevard where a vehicle caught fire, Mm -hmm. a teenager trapped inside and literally what disturbed me most was to see citizens here recording Mm -hmm. and then you see these firefighters come in you know jump into action while the car is still burning cutting that kid out of the car and today he survived because of mfrd firefighters just talk about those type of heroic efforts that may go unnoticed Absolutely. It happens every day. It's not always on the news, Mm -hmm. um, but we every day, I think our people are responding to incidents, Mm -hmm. maybe not quite as dramatic as that, but they're making a significant impact on the citizens' lives in Murfreesboro, and it falls back on their training, whether it be fire, medical, vehicle extrication, um, but it's just, you can't do these jobs because especially when the adrenaline's up without the proper training because you're going you're gonna to forget what to do, mm-hmm. you know. So um, just staying constantly up on skills and um, yeah. constantly training and constantly drilling is important. So when it is dramatic like that, uh, we can just have muscle memory and not have to think about what we're doing. We just do it. And those, that group out there did a most excellent job. And on that one call, I think they probably put every ounce of training they had, you know, from extinguishing the fire to extricating to medical care. It's like almost every single skill that they are learned or taught was, were, uh, were put into action that particular night. Absolutely. And they, they would probably tell you they would train their whole career just to make one significant save like that. Mm-hmm. And it makes it all worth it. And does that make you feel good at the end of the day? It does. It does. I'm proud of those guys, and I'm proud of all of our ladies and gentlemen that work out there every day because they do a great job. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you want to add about training that I failed to ask you? You know, have we missed anything? Um, I don't think so. Just we appreciate the continued support of the city to make us the best fire department that we can be because without the support of city administration and – we would have nothing to work with and we wouldn't be able to be the top-notch fire department that I think we've come to be. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been talking training with uh, Murfreesboro Fire Rescue Department Assistant Chief of Training, Nicole Miller. Uh, Assistant Chief Miller, thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Larry. Sure, sure. The Public Safety Podcast is recorded in the Murfreesboro City Hall Chambers. Thanks for listening via Podbean, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music Audible. You can also watch the Public Safety Podcast on YouTube as well as City TV 3. The Public Safety Podcast is produced by Michael Nevels. 
For more information on public safety and the fast-growing city of Murfreesboro, visit www.murfreesborotn.gov. Until next time, I'm Larry Flowers. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.